When I see a patient who has a new diagnosis of brain metastases from HER2 positive breast cancer, I'm first going to do a clinical and radiological assessment, and then I'm going to make an assessment about whether um, the patient would be better suited for local therapy such as radiation versus systemic therapy. Then I'm going to think about the systemic therapy options that are available to this patient which have intracranial activity, and finally think about the appropriate sequencing of those regimens in that patient. When I see somebody with HER2 positive breast cancer with a diagnosis of brain metastasis, I want to first be sure that there has been appropriate imaging and that typically is an MRI scan with and without contrast. And from a clinical perspective, I'm uh, assessing symptoms such as headaches, nausea, or vomiting, and a neurological exam, including an exam of the cranial nerves, strength, balance, and coordination. Uh, and then on the MRI scan, I'm looking for the location, size, um, and any associated edema of CNS lesions. In terms of the uh, prognosis of patients with brain metastases, one of the most important factors is actually the subtype. And patients who have HER2 positive subtype fare the best compared to other subtypes of breast cancer. In a large international study that included um, 18 sites over three countries and almost 2,500 patients with breast cancer brain metastases, the prognostic factors of interest include the subtype of breast cancer, the uh, performance status, the age of the patient, extracranial metastasis status. And so these are factors that I look at. Interestingly, for HER2 positive patients with good, with good performance status, the median survival from a brain met diagnosis is between two to three years at this point with modern therapies. And there are a substantial minority of patients alive at five years or longer. One of the complicating factors about treating patients with brain metastases are that there are multiple modalities of therapy that could be considered, most typically uh, radiation therapy versus systemic therapy. In the past, radiation therapy was the default choice for virtually all patients with brain metastases, but now, especially in HER2 disease, where the systemic therapies are more active, we are now increasingly making choices between systemic therapy and radiation therapy. In a patient who presents with a small number of lesions that are amenable to stereotactic radiosurgery and has controlled extracranial disease, oftentimes as their initial treatment, I will refer patients for radiation. However, patients who have progressed after previous radiation, patients who have a, a high brain metastasis velocity where there are multiple lesions that are occurring over a short period of time, uh, those are patients that I'm more likely to consider systemic therapy for. There are an increasing number of systemic therapies for patients who have HER2 positive breast cancer that have demonstrated intracranial activity. And these include HER2 targeted TKIs, as well as the unmonoclonal antibodies and antibody drug conjugates. Now the HER2 TKIs make sense, they're small molecules, many of them are able to get into the um, brain metastasis. And these include medicines like tacatinib or neratinib, which have demonstrated activity with response rate in the 50% range as well as older drugs such as lapatinib and drugs that are available not everywhere in the world um, but one that's available in China called pyrotinib. It turns out that the antibodies and antibody drug conjugates, although they don't cross an intact blood-brain barrier, do seem to cross a disrupted blood tumor barrier. And so we have seen convincing evidence of activity with uh, treatments as diverse as high-dose trastuzumab and pertuzumab with TDM1 and then with the newest antibody drug conjugate, trastuzumab durextecan, which interestingly in both preclinical models and in patients uh, does seem to have intracranial activity with a very high response rate. Once I've made a decision to recommend systemic therapy for a patient with active brain metastasis, what I'm trying to think about is the sequence uh, of treatment because now we are fortunate to have several options that are effective. In general, if somebody has not previously received tacatinib, uh, I'm generally choosing the tacatinib capecitabine trastuzumab regimen first, and that's on the basis of the HER2 CLIMB clinical trial where there was a substantial overall survival gain associated with tacatinib 
and the median overall survival went from about 12 to 21 months, so an over nine month uh, absolute gain. The other option that I would consider next would be TDXD or trastuzumab terexacan. The studies have been small so far, but the response rates that have been reported in patients with active brain metastases range between about 45 to 73 percent. So again, that looks like a very active drug. Uh, the final consideration is the status of a patient's extracranial disease. We know from the DB3 trial that TDXD is highly active in extracranial sites. And so if somebody has both progression of extracranial disease that's significant as well as intracranial progression, I might select TDXD before ticatinib. After those initial choices, in whichever order one chooses them, ticatinib and TDXD, then other options include the potential to give neratinib and capecitabine. Now we don't know what the activity of that combination is after ticatinib, capecitabine, trastuzumab. We do know from the TBCRC022 trial that in patients who had previously received lapatinib that there is in fact activity of the neratinib, capecitabine combination. There are also other treatments that could be considered including TDM1, which um, does appear to have intracranial activity and then combinations of chemotherapy with trastuzumab, and finally, high-dose trastuzumab-pertuzumab.